uh, in spite of many efforts and many papers containing interesting partial results, uh, we still uh, don't know uh, what's uh, <coughs> going on there. So, um, one possible approach to this problem uh, is the following. That you look at the edges of the graph, they are straight line segments, and you consider the intersection graph of them, those straight line segments. What does it mean? You assign a vertex to each segment and you connect to vertices if the segments cross. Now, the condition that there are no k pairwise crossing edges simply translates into saying that that graph does not contain uh, a clique of size k. And uh, we know a lot of results uh, in extremal graph theory uh, that kind of uh, uh, explore the properties of uh, graphs that don't contain large cliques. And uh, we obviously try to apply those results. But unfortunately, those results usually either don't work at all or give very weak uh, sort of consequences for our original problem. So this talk also has a kind of unofficial uh, title, uh, The Importance of Being Uncomplicated. I just, just realized when I uh, you know, looked through these uh, slides that uh, uncomplicated is actually simple. So probably it would have been much nicer if I don't want to be complicated to write here simple, but what can I do? It's too late. Uh, but uh, this is the moral of the story, so in case you cannot last to the end, I, I give away the moral of the story. The moral is that uh, uh, extreme graph theory uh, sort of deals with very complicated questions because of the abstraction, because usually it has to deal with properties of all graphs. And those graphs that uh, we encounter uh, in geometric situations, they are not all graphs, they are very special graphs. And very often, for special graphs, we have kind of uh, uh, simpler situations. Of course, what it means that the graph is uncomplicated or simple, it's a big question mark, and uh, I have plagiarized this uh, title page from uh, Oscar Wilde's uh, classic, where this Ernest, of course, no one knows who Ernest is in the play, and uh, this, this is kind of the parallel, the same big question mark we, uh, we have here. Okay, so, uh, so what I, I'd like to consider here is that I'd like to look at three cornerstones of extreme graph theory, uh, which are, you don't have to know these results, because uh, uh, when I get to that, then I will state the results, because I'm sure that uh, many of you know better than I do what they are, and uh, we'll see that if you restrict our attention to kind of special, nice, uncomplicated graphs, uh, and to what extent we can improve on those theorems. So the first one, uh, first cornerstone is this uh, Bremsis theorem, and uh, in particular David talked about this theorem in uh, great detail. I also put here uh, Erdős and Szekeres's name because they proved the quantitative version and in uh, this talk, I, I will actually be interested in quantitative aspects of the problem. It was also historically the first result in uh, stigma graphs, perhaps. The second theorem, Corners to the Sturans theorem, we will get to that. Uh, and from our point of view, uh, perhaps uh, the second or third theorem in this subject, the Bövan is or Sturans theorem. Uh, will be more interesting. And the uh, third cornerstone is the semantic irregularity lemma. And again, I think that uh, <coughs> perhaps Jacob will talk about it, right? 
so you will hear, you will know everything after these talks uh, that, that you ever wanted to know about this. Okay, so, so let's start with the, uh, with the legacy thing. So, the other, Sekeres theorem, the, the quantitative version of Francis theorem, uh, says the following, that uh, we denote by R, R of N, uh, the largest number is the property that you, if you take a complete graph of n vertices and you color the edges by red and blue, then you can find a large monochromatic subgraph. Large, I mean that one which has at least uh, r of n vertices. Monochromatic it means that between these vertices all the edges are red or all the edges are no. Now, Tendős and Szekeres proved that large is actually, in this case, one half of uh, log n, and uh, in fact, uh, ten years later, as, as we know it from daily, uh, Erdős is one of the sort of most elegant applications of the probabilistic method, proved that the order of magnitude of log n is correct. And uh, there were lots of uh, uh, results uh, <coughs> concerning the truth here, uh, small improvements on, uh, on these results, and they were summarized in, in, in David's talk. And of course, Ramsey, uh, who was a logician mainly, was also interested not only in graphs, but ternary relations, Quaternary relations and so on. So, for instance, uh, the uh, version for three uniform hypergraphs is the following: we take uh, n vertices, and R three of n means the uh, largest number. So that if you color all triples of the, on those n vertices by red and blue, then uh, we can find that. Uh, large monochromatic part, and how large is large, as Erdős and Rado and, and Heinal proved in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, actually uh, the uh, large means log log n, uh, and unfortunately from the other direction we don't know that, but it is widely conjectured that the truth is uh, log log n. And if instead of three tuples, you consider four tuples, then uh, the corresponding function will be log, log, log. And every time you increase the uniformity by one, uh, size of the tuples, then you get uh, one more log. Now, uh, let's see uh, that, uh, a couple of applications of uh, Ramsey's theorem. Sorry. So the first one uh, is a very well-known application that shows up already uh, in the original Erdős-Tekeres paper. You take a sequence of legs n, sequence of real, real numbers, x1, x, xn, and uh, you want to find a large monotone subsequence in it, either monotone increasing or monotone decreasing. Now this is a typical setup for theorem because we can do, you take uh, two indices, i and j, where i is smaller than j, and uh, if xi is smaller than xj, then you connect xi and xj uh, by a red edge, and if uh, xi is larger than xj, by a blue edge. So you find a large uh, monochromatic subgraph in this graph, how large r2 of n, size log n, and that will correspond to a monotone decreasing or a monotone increasing subsequence of, of size. However, already in the other Sekerec paper, as you know, uh, a much better and nicer bound is proved, which is also type, roughly. Uh, this is uh, square root of n. Okay, so let's uh, look at another. So we consider n segments in the plane, uh, and we look at their intersection. 
we want to find uh, among these n segments a lot of segments that are pairwise intersecting or a lot of segments that are pairwise disjoint. So if two segments intersect, then we connect them by a red edge, if they are disjoint by a blue edge, again we can apply Ramsey theorem and we get uh, log n edges that are uh, pairwise intersecting or log n edges that are pairwise uh, disjoint. However, uh, 20 years ago, uh, in a paper uh, joined with uh, Larman, Matushek, and Tereci, we proved a much better result without using Ramsey theorem and to the boundaries. Actually, we don't know if this exponent one to the fifth one, uh, the exponent one fifth is correct. Probably not. Any improvement on this bound uh, would be interesting. I think that this is a not entirely hopeless. <laughs> okay, so here is a third application uh, for triples rather than graphs now. Uh, you take endpoints in a plane, this also comes from the original Adler-Sakarash paper. We arbitrarily renumber the points from 1 to n, and we want to find a large convex gate large convex polygon with as many vertices as possible. So what we can do is that we take three points and uh, this in, in the order how they increase and then the corresponding triple is either clockwise oriented, then we color it red, or counterclockwise oriented, then we color it blue. Again, by applying the hypergraph version, the triple version of the of Ramsey's theorem, uh, we find log log n points so that uh, uh, all of the triples determined by them are uh, clockwise oriented or all of them are counterclockwise oriented. In both cases we have a convex polygon with log log n vertices. But already Erdős and Szekeres did better because uh, in, in that classic paper in 1935, 80 years ago they proved uh, instead of log log n, in order of magnitude better, they found a uh, polygon with log n vertices, convex polygon with log n vertices. Now, let me show uh, the, uh, an interesting example of uh, a Turan type theorem with a uh, geometric consequence. So, this is the Kővári Sós Turan theorem, which some form was already proved by uh, Erdős a little earlier. So uh, the theorem says the following, we take a graph with n vertices, it doesn't contain a KRR, a complete bipartite graph with R, R vertices in its classes, then it follows that the number of edges of the graph is at most n to the 2 minus 1 over R, which is of course smaller than the trivial bound that it choose 2 quadratic. Now, there is a simple uh, application of, uh, of this result. Uh, we can take n points and n lines in the plane, and uh, we say that there is an incidence between them if a point happens to be on a line. And uh, it is clear that we can build this incident graph. This is a bipartite graph. On one side, you have the points corresponding to the points, on the other side, the points corresponding to the lines. And if there's an incidence, you connect them. But this graph does not contain a K22, so we can apply uh, the Kővári Sós Turán theorem with R equals 2, because if you take two points, then there is at most one line that passes through them, and then you get that the number of incidences is at most n to the 3 Very nice, non trivial bound. However, uh, Severity and Trotter in their celebrated theorem 30 years ago uh, uh, proved a tight bound, which is actually at n to the fourth third. So, what's going on here? There are all these nice geometric examples. In all of them, all of them offer themselves uh, uh, to an application of uh, Ramsey's theorem, or Turan's theorem, Stenograph's theory. And every time 
uh, we get a weak result. If you don't, if you avoid the classical axiomal graph symmetric results, then actually uh, we do better. Now, uh, there are several possibilities here. So one possibility would be that uh, uh, our combinatorial tools are too weak, which is not the case in Ramsey's graph theorem, but here, for instance, uh, in the Kovari short theorem, theorem, it is true that we still don't know the truth. Uh, of course, the truth will never take us to into the fourth third, so this is not what's happening. What's happening is, uh, as I indicated before, that uh, these theorems uh, say something about all graphs. And in particular, for many of those theorems, uh, the extremal graphs kind of have a random structure. Now those graphs, geometric graphs that we consider, the structure, their structure is strictly non-random. So although the results may be tied for all graphs, but for nice graphs, we may well do much better. So the question is, as I said, this is the big question mark, but what does it mean that the graph is nice? And I will offer you some definition. Uh, well, you may this find this definition not nice, uh, but actually it's not very bad. What you may not find nice is the name, but unfortunately, you know, that's the name what is used uh, for, for these sets. So, in what follows, when I say semi-algebraic, you basically have to think that these are the nice graphs and hypergraphs. But first I have to define what a nice set, a semi-algebraic set is. So we take the set of all points uh, in the d-dimensional space, that satisfy a small number of polynomial equations or inequalities uh, of degree at most t. Small number, let's say that at most t equations and, and uh, uh, inequalities of which are polynomials uh, of degree at most t. And moreover, there is a Boolean formula here, so this means that uh, if I take two nice sets, then the union of those sets, the intersection of those sets, I also consider nice. And there is a parameter here, this parameter which is t, or rather the uh, maximum of t, the dimension and t, and that's usually we call the complexity of this nice set, the complexity of this set. Once we have the notion of a semi-algebraic set, then it is easy to define a semi-algebraic graph. So what we can do is the following. That we take two copies of this d-dimensional space, sort of orthogonal to each other, uh, then they will induce a 2D-dimensional space. In that 2D-dimensional space, we take a nice set, a semi-algebraic set, and then, if you pick a point x and a point y in the uh, other space, uh, d-dimensional space, we simply look at the pair x, y, which is a point in the 2d-dimensional space, and if it falls into this nice yellow set, then we connect them by an edge. If it doesn't fall into this set, then we don't. If our graph can be defined in such a way, then I call it the semi algebraic graph. And obviously, in the same way, I can define semi algebraic uh, hypergraphs, triple systems, uh, K array relations. So, for instance, if K is equal to, to 3, I can say the following that I can take three copies of d dimensional spaces. In the 3D dimensional space, I consider a nice set, and I say that x, y, z belong to my hypergraph if and only if the triple x, y, z falls into that nice set in the 3D dimensional space. Now, this may look uh, uh, a little complicated, but actually, the truth is that all of the previous examples that I showed belong to this category. 
and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, most natural sort of polynomially definable uh, geometric examples that you can think of uh, are uh, nice graphs and nice semi algebraic hypergraphs. So here are the particular examples. For instance, if I take an intersection graph of segments, uh, then uh, this is a semi algebraic uh, uh, sort of graph because a segment you can characterize by its two endpoints. The two endpoints, each of them uh, have two coordinates, so you can characterize a segment by a point in the four dimensional space. And if I give you the coordinates of two points, two segments, two points in the four dimensional space, then by checking a small number of uh, uh, polynomial inequalities, you can decide whether the two segments intersect or don't intersect. And if they intersect and connect them, otherwise not. So this is a typical example of a, of a uh, semi algebraic graph. Now, you may wonder here already at this example that I was kind of vague about uh, the complexity issue because these are points in the four-dimensional space, what kind of polynomial inequalities there are, and how many of them there are. Uh, and this is really an issue, but luckily, in most of the theorems that we will consider, the only important condition will be uh, that there is an absolute bound for the complexity. Whether that bound is 4 or 400, of course, it will slightly affect the constants in the quantitative results, but in general, uh, it will uh, leave the uh, sort of nature of the results unchanged. Okay, so another example that we considered previously, we considered triples and uh, a triple of points, whether they are clockwise oriented or counterclockwise. This is again typically a semi algebraic property. Because if you have three points, then to decide whether the uh, orientation of that triple is uh, clockwise or counterclockwise, you have to evaluate a determinant, a C by C determinant, whether it's positive or negative. So it's a, it's a polynomial again. <clears throat> and in general, you know, you can take, for instance, in the three dimensional space, polytopes with at most uh, 10 faces, and you could say that a triple uh, is related. Uh, three of these polytopes are related if there is a uh, line stepping all of them. That's a semi-algebraic uh, uh, ternary relation, and it's not even important that the sides of those polytopes uh, should be flat. They could be kind of polynomial surfaces or anything. It's still all of these things fall into this category of nice relations, semi algebraic graphs and hypergraph. Okay, so what we'd like to do is uh, now uh, that we'd like to uh, develop some kind of uh, uh, semi algebraic Ramsey theory. So the Ramsey function are in the uh, sort of inverse form. Uh, is the following that I denote by Rk of n, the smallest number r, with the property that uh, in every two coloring of all k tuples uh, of an r element set, there is a monochromatic set of size n. And then I can consider exactly the same function. Uh, I put here a, a little upper index t. Uh, which sort of indicates uh, that I'm restricting my attention to uh, semi-algebraic uh, colorings of, of complexity at most d. Then, of course, the corresponding function can only be smaller than the general uh, uh, Ramsey function. And for the general Ramsey function, uh, we know from Erdős and Rado that uh, the upper bound is a Tower of height, height k, 2 to the 2 to the 2 to the cn. So let's see 
uh, what happens if we restrict our attention to semi-algebraic colorings? Well, then uh, together with uh, David Conlon, Jacob Fox, Fanny Sulakov, and Andrew Suk, uh, we showed that uh, we can improve this bound. The tower gets sort of the height of the tower gets uh, one shorter. Uh, moreover, in some sense, and I don't want to uh, tell exactly in what sense, uh, this bound is tight. And this improvement here takes care of uh, most of those examples uh, that I showed at the beginning uh, of my talk. At least, you know, uh, as far as the order of magnitude is concerned. Now, here there is a short remark uh, that, in effect, for semi algebraic graphs, this result was proved in an earlier paper, joint paper with Noka Alon, Rompi, Kasi, Rado Stadojic, and uh, Miha Shalir. Uh, and even earlier, in a special case, uh, in a paper uh, joint with uh, Joseph Shoimoshi. And uh, this base case, the case of graphs, is interesting and important uh, because the idea of the proof is to go back to the original Erdős-Heiner Rado methods, and they build an induction, a sort of stepping up mechanism. Uh, in order to uh, show how to get a result for k-uniform hypergraphs, once we know, uh, have a Ramsey result for k-1 uniform hypergraphs. And one of the main ideas of the proof is that uh, to, to make sure that during this process, uh, all the sets that we create are semi-algebraic sets, uh, and nice sets we have to keep under control. Uh, to some extent, their complexity. Okay, so my next second example was uh, uh, two rank theory. Uh, and uh, here, let me recall the simplest case of uh, two rank theory, which was proved by Mantle uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. So, again, with an ugly but standard notation of extremal graph theories we denote by x n k3 the largest number of edges that a uh, graph of n vertices can have if it contains no triangle. It would be hard to think of any ugly notation for that, but that's not my fault. And what Mantle proved is that this number is n squared divided by 4. So the extremal example is that we take uh, n, n uh, bipartite, complete bipartite graphs with n half vertices uh, in its classes, and uh, we connect two vertices if and only if they belong to uh, different classes, that n squared divided by four edges. So let's see if uh, the theorem improves if you restrict. Uh, our attention, we put here again this uh, letter T indicating that we are looking at uh, semi algebraic graphs. So, if you restrict our attention to semi algebraic graphs of uh, uh, bounded complexity, well, unfortunately, it doesn't. Because, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I mean, it depends from your standpoint. So, uh, clearly, this graph you can represent as an intersection graph of segments. Because you can take for these n half vertices n half horizontal segments, for those n half vertices uh, n half vertical segments, and then their intersection pattern, intersection graph, is exactly this graph. And that, as we have seen, is a nice semi algebraic graph. So nothing happens here. So perhaps there is nothing interesting. However, there is something interesting, because even if you restrict our attention to segment intersection graphs, like previously, which is a subclass of, of uh, uh, semi-algebraic graphs, uh, so this means that this, this ugly notation are here now, x sec n of h means that the maximum number of edges that that segment intersection graph of n vertices can have if it doesn't contain a subgraph isomorphic to, to 
to age, then uh, by the Bővári Sós Turán Theorem, uh, x n k to 2, if you exclude for abstract graphs, if you exclude k to 2, we have seen that the number of edges is roughly n to the c half. However, if we exclude a k to 2 in a segment intersection graph, then we get a much better result. It becomes linear immediately. Uh, this I proved uh, together with Viha uh, uh, And then, in fact, uh, uh, it, uh, uh, later it was generalized uh, from K to 2 to KRR. So if you forbid anything in segment intersection, then immediately from the Kővári Sors Turán part, uh, we uh, get a linear. Now, here comes the first kind of disturbing fact. Uh, this, this, uh, this is the paper where we proved it, uh, together with Jacob, uh, that actually this theorem has nothing to do with algebraicity. So here is the theorem, it says that if you have an intersection, any curves, continuous curves in the plane, if you exclude uh, KRR, then uh, the uh, number of edges is at most linear. So uh, this is, uh, you know, a uh, big question here whether this algebraicity is really just a condition that is convenient to use, or perhaps there is a deeper uh, topological uh, sort of assumption lurking in the background that we uh, haven't discovered yet. Now, let's go a little bit uh, uh, further, because I still haven't said anything about uh, uh, the, our example, uh, the semi detrotter example, right? Uh, where we have seen that uh, it is possible to give n points in the plane and n lines in the plane, according to semi detrotter so that the, uh, their incidence graph uh, has n to the three, n to the uh, four third edges. So this really corresponds to, a, again, a bipartite graph. Here I put the lines, here I put the, uh, the points, and it is a nice semi-algebraic graph. So clearly, it is not true that for any semi-algebraic graph, uh, of bounded complexity, uh, immediately if I forbid something, then the number of edges will go down to linear. Here is a counterexample. However, it goes down to n to the fourth third. And uh, this is a, a recent uh, joint paper with Jacob Cox, Adam Schaeffer, Andrew Souk, and Joshua Tsal, uh, which uh, uh, proves that if you have uh, so this is the statement we have, uh, now it's more convenient to state it in a bipartite setting. We have a bipartite graph, uh, and uh, the vertex classes V1 and V2 correspond to points in the d-dimensional space. Uh, and uh, uh, we assume that it is a KRR-free semi-algebraic graph. Then, if D is 2, if the uh, vertices of the graph corresponds to points in the plane, uh, which is the situation here, it's a planar situation, uh, with a little bit of line, uh, then uh, the number of edges is n to the fourth third. So actually that n to the fourth third, the semi detrotter theorem is a consequence of that. And uh, if d is higher, we still have uh, a non-trivial result, which at first glance may look exactly like the original Kövári uh, Sós Turán theorem. But it is not. Because the interesting thing is that these theorems are independent, uh, qualitatively, quantitatively independent uh, from the parameter R. Doesn't matter what I forbid. I forbid anything. Uh, then 
uh, it will uh, sort of be reduced to, uh, to an exponent uh, uh, smaller than 2, and uh, the improvement essentially depends only on the dimension in which uh, our examples live. Now, there are uh, several uh, sort of uh, things used in this proof. Uh, in particular, uh, there are algebraic methods used, and VC dimension uh, uh, is uh, used. And here again, there is a slightly annoying, or if you wish, interesting fact that uh, again we are not completely convinced that uh, this parameter, the dimension, is. Uh, the most important or the only parameter that uh, plays a role uh, in this problem. So it, it nicely matches the uh, summary de Trotter bound in this case. However, we also have a theorem, and I don't want to explain it uh, uh, in detail, just I am sort of flashing it uh, uh, to you, that a very similar theorem in which Instead of uh, uh, in the, the parameter p will not mean the dimension in which uh, our semi-algebraic graph lives, but it means the VC dimension of uh, my bipartite graph. So if you uh, don't know the notion of VC dimension, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, let me just... Uh, uh, tell you when I, for those who know the notion of it, so a set system has a VC dimension, uh, uh, and then I define the VC dimension of a bipartite graph in the following way, that bipartite graph has two vertex classes, I take a vertex in the first class and I look at its neighborhood. These neighborhoods form a set system, and I consider the dimension, this is dimension of that set system. But if this is bounded, then I say that uh, this is a nice uh, uh, graph of uh, bounded VC dimension. And for that, we also have a, a similar theorem. And it's kind of a wider class because we know that if uh, uh, a graph is semi algebraic, then the VC dimension is bounded. Of course, it's a different issue that how goes. Oh. Oh. Okay. Uh, that how those uh, uh, parameters D are related to each other. So again, what nicety is whether it is VC dimension or uh, the complexity of the semi algebraic graph, we are not 100% sure and it may well be a third parameter. So finally, uh, very quickly, I don't want to, definitely I don't want to uh, go into that. Uh, uh, again, for those who have seen the summary irregularity lemma, it's a beautiful theorem for, which is valid for all graphs, and uh, essentially what it says is that uh, if you fix any small number epsilon, then, uh, which is like an error term, then any graph of n vertices uh, has a vertex partition into a small number of uh, classes of equal size, so that if you look at a pair of classes, then uh, it always, uh, with, with the exception of an epsilon fraction of all pairs, uh, every pair behaves with an error of epsilon like a random graph. Uh, so, sort of, uh, uh, this is not just technically, but also philosophic, philosophically a very important theorem, which now uh, has uh, a lot of interesting generalizations and extensions. Uh, again, I refer to, to Jacob's talk. Uh, but let me just indicate 
what happens uh, if we restrict our attention to semi-algebraic graphs. If we, attention, if, we, if we restrict our attention to semi-algebraic graphs, then actually the semi-relative regularity lemma becomes much, much nicer. So what happens is that again, uh, every nice semi-algebraic graph, the vertex set can be uh, divided into a small number of equal passes, so that again, with the exception of uh, epsilon fraction of, uh, of all pairs, uh, every pair is not just like a random graph. Every pair is perfect. Either uh, the all edges between the two classes are there, with no exception, or no single edge is there. So, in some sense, uh, semi-algebraicity takes out the randomness uh, from the semi regularity lemma. Now, uh, this was, again, uh, uh, started with a uh, with a uh, joint paper with uh, uh, Joseph Shoimoshi, and then uh, it again has traces in the joint paper with Alon, and finally it has a hypergraph version which is very uh, similar to that. I don't want to tell you, but a perfect hypergraph version, and in, a, in uh, which was spelled out uh, in the joint paper with uh, Fox, Gromo, Lafort, and Nauer, and then now we have an improved version in which we have very nice uh, polynomial dependence on the number of classes, on bar over epsilon, uh, and so on. So uh, this is kind of a uh, very satisfying uh, development from our point of view. So let me just finish at this point with a poster uh, of uh, a Singapore production of the uh, importance of, of being earnest. And I think that this is just perfectly summarizes this poster, what I wanted to say, because uh, it says that the truth is rarely pure and never simple. And unfortunately, our original goal was to simplify those uh, uh, three cornerstones of uh, uh, extremal graph theory and uh, well, we are not sure that they are really the right simplification. But that's what we have. Thank you very much. For examples uh, in which it is tied, but, but then for the examples we really have to incre increase the dimension a lot. So uh, in this sense, uh, uh, so if you, if you uh, refer to the, uh, those bounds apart from the, and to the fourth bound, uh, we don't know uh, if they are tied uh, in, in, in small dimensions. So. Is that correct? <laughs> yes, we don't know it's correct. We don't know it's time. I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. More questions? If not, let me ask one question. I would like to return to this description uh, complexity issues. You showed us several examples of semi algebraic structures like the intersection graph of lines and so on, and you said it's difficult to. Mm -hmm. So, is there any comp computational computability results on the description uh, complexity of given example, like given an intersection graph of line segments. Uh, yeah. Can you compute this description complexity? Yes, but uh, so there are 
Uh, most of those uh, results that I can, we can prove for, uh, which are kind of computability, uh, they are uh, uh, randomized algorithms and they are consequences of the fact uh, that uh, there is a much nicer uh, summary irregularity lemma. Therefore, uh, if you sample uh, a graph of uh, uh, bounded uh, complexity, then uh, after a fairly small, taking a very, fairly small sample, you have uh, kind of an educated guess. Uh, this means that with 99.9% .9 probability you can tell if the graph contains uh, a certain subgraph or not. Are there more questions or comments? If not, let's thank uh, Janusz again.